uh, once the walkthroughs and we have a better understanding of the function, uh, we conduct a risk assessment, uh, meaning that we'll take out the different aspects of the business and see where uh, things uh, may go wrong, or where we may be liable, where there's a compliance issue or efficiency or effectiveness issue. So we, at that time, we do that assessment. Uh, once that is done, we develop the audit plan. Uh, basically, the objectives are laid out at the beginning, then we need to define the steps on the, those objectives to answer the objectives. Uh, and once that's done, we develop the budget based on the audit plan, uh, what we think a judgment on how long it will take to answer each one of those steps. Once the auditors have their audit plan, uh, they perform the field work. Uh, whether it's testing, uh, the benchmarking, whenever it's applicable. Uh, they uh, do a field work, um, for instance, if we do some testing on, let's say, there are dupl if there are any duplicate payments. Um, once the work is completed, uh, the, the spreadsheet is sent to management, whoever they are working with, to validate or clarify the, the findings. For instance, if we found that there are 10 duplicate payments worth 10,000 hours, at that time, that spreadsheet is shared with uh, the person that they're working with to make sure that, is, uh, that they validate the findings. Um, also, there's a, they need to have, we have proper documentation where we have, for instance, with, with the validation, we will have a spreadsheet to show what we tested. We we'll have the attributes tested and what the findings for. Um, we also have status meetings. Um, as we conduct the work, uh, we conduct meetings to discuss where we are in the process and any of the issues that have been shared with management. And that's a good time to try and clarify any, um, any of the information that has been shared with them. Uh, and we, of course, issue the recommendations based on the um, Now moving on to the uh, audit process, to the report process. Uh, once the field work is completed, uh, we, we, a draft is written and is shared with management. Uh, within two weeks time, we'd like to meet with management to discuss the draft, uh, which is a time to discuss any the, the recommendations that in the report and what the report is in general is discussed. Um, and we start that we call an exit meeting. Um, managing at that time, uh, managing responses, we request uh, managing responses within 10 working days. Um, and as we know, the report is then uh, briefed to the other committee. Once we receive the responses from management, we compile the report and submit it to the other committee members, uh, which is discussed at the next, at the following meeting. One one of the things that I, I wanted to point out that throughout this process, you know, in various status meetings or various validation process, management has ample opportunity to communicate uh, anything that if we miss something or if we did not understand something, uh, uh, then they have ample opportunity to provide the adequate evidence so that that particular finding does not get into the report. Well, say for example, if we have five findings and management comes back and say, okay, one of the findings uh, is not accurate because we missed something. There is some additional evidence available that we did not plot. So they can provide additional evidence and after examining that evidence, if we feel that uh, uh, yes, their position is justified, then we will take the finding off the off of the table, and only four findings will get into the report. And um, that occurs during the, the interviews. I'm sorry. That process takes place during the exit interviews. 
or not the exit interviews, but when you have conversations. That that process take, can take place during the entire audit. Uh, even when we give validation, say for example, in Lily's example, we found 10 duplicates, but for some reason, one of the observations, they didn't feel like it is a duplication, then we, we can meet, meet on that issue and they can provide us uh, documentation, we can sh share our documentation and figure it out whether it is a duplicate item or not. And if it is not a duplicate item, then okay, then our observation becomes nine duplicates instead of ten duplicates. Are there other questions on this? Yes. Um, first, I want to thank you all for coming in to share this with us. And I know that we've been through this procedure process probably many times. And I, we, the audit committee also plans to go back and review this process as well. Um, there, continue to be a lot of being able to finalize the audits with the recommendations a part of the final audit um, when the audit comes to the committee. A um, couple questions, mm -hmm. Madam President. When there are concerns that are expressed by management in regards to the audits throughout the entire process, do you receive, are any of those uh, recommendations received, are they written or are they discussions? Well, <clears throat> many times, I mean, it depends on when. If it is during the audit process, and if it happens during uh, uh, the, one of the status meeting, then there is after following that status meeting, there is going to be uh, back and forth uh, communication, and that will be probably uh, in the form of emails. So there is a documentation. There is documentation. Okay. So in in cases where management disagrees with uh, your findings uh, or your evaluation of your findings and you don't agree with their disagreement um, and you don't come to a resolve, how is that handled? Well, the thing is that in that particular <coughs> instance, what we're looking for during the audit process is valid evidence. If management is able to produce valid evidence, then it is a non-issue because we can drop that file if it supports the, uh, their position. But if it does not, or if the evidence is weak, we may agree to disagree. And in that case, that finding will get into the report. And they would still have the right to say, we don't agree with this, we're not so going to. Mr. one of uh I would say the majority of the time is usually the, there's no disagreement on the recommendation as we discuss the finding with, with, the, with the team. Um, most of the disagreements come when the report is written. Uh, so, for instance, if we found those 10 duplicates, we share the information. Um, they, may not, they may just accept and say there is no, okay, you're right, there are 10. But then when the recommendation makes it to the report, that that's, uh, a lot of discussion starts happening at that point. What needs to happen when the information is shared. And I think we have got, uh, and I appreciate you guys coming today, we've got all these tax exemption like designations to deal with today. But I think it might be <coughs> of all, I think this is a discussion that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a discussion where council needs to hear um, hear maybe both sides of the issue in terms of how the auditor sees the process working and how in terms of how management sees it working. So I would ask Lou if we could continue this discussion, Lou, to the next org development. Okay.
Thanks. Yes, ma'am. What can I also suggest, perhaps, that I know that there is a meeting that is going to be held by the audit committee for the same purposes, mm -hmm. in essence. And if we could make sure that as a part of that discussion with the audit committee, that both parties are there so mm -hmm. that we can just have a round the table discussion. Uh, I think we all have the same motive and the objective is to make sure that we get um, have a full audit report and the opportunity to clearly articulate what is agreed the and what is the agreed upon and what is the response uh, in regards to the findings that come out. So, um, I would ask that as a part of that audit committee that we make sure that that agenda allows for that and then when it comes back to this committee we will at least have had an opportunity mm -hmm. to get come with a recommendation from the audit committee as well. But what you're suggesting for October is that the audit committee? Well, let's, let's wait till after the audit committee meeting. Okay. And then we'll have the auditor and administration come and discuss with us the policies that have been agreed on. That's what I'm asking. What are you saying in that meeting is going to take? Oh, I'm not sure. Do I have that in September? Morning. Yeah. So it would be, so we could do it in October. That's what I'm saying. So, so it would be the order and administration to discuss the art process. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So now moving right along on our agenda. Thank you. We're going to continue. I don't know. That's all we did about it. That's all we're going to do about the article. That's all we do the, if the only conversation that we were going to have with the auditor today was about the audit protocol, yes. Is there a flaw in the protocol? Uh, I think there are a couple of bumps that need to be worked out. And so the audit, the, where we are right now is the audit committee, administration, and the auditor are going to meet September 20th, and then we will come back to council on the, the uh, organizational development in October to discuss what what those or what those two bodies see as a resolution to some of the bumps in the audit protocol. The flaws in the MGE office is more relevant to us than to everybody else today. At what point do we address what was found in the audit and ultimately agreed to by the MBE director. When you've got contracts being signed every day and opportunities to get contracts fleeting, we're going to re-examine the auditor and not the MBE office who has agreed to the recommendations. What we had on the agenda for today, if you would like us to have, I guess, what you're asking for, Marty, is that, and I don't know if we can do it Monday because we'll see how this tax exam thing goes. The biggest thing we have going right now is this tax exam thing. I hear what you're saying about MBA, but in terms of time, we have like 22 or 23 of these tax exam papers that we need to look at before Monday. But what you're asking is that we have. Um, we need to address. If you want the, the if you want the audit, office. if you would like to have the exact same presentation that was made at the audit committee, and that would be what the auditor's findings and administration their responses. We can arrange for that. Maybe not this. Maybe not. This council meeting. Well, that was council. done. I know it was. And the auditor who had initially, I mean, the uh, MBE director who had initially rejected eight or nine of the recommendations finally accepted them. With conditions. Mm -hmm. With conditions. Well, we're the governing body. We set the conditions. And I'm trying to find out how do you have revealed before us these numbers of flaws? And we're going to re-examine the auditor instead of addressing the problem in the MBO. 
We're not, we're not, we're not re-examining the audit term. We're trying to make sure that this process works. What I'm asking you is, what is it you want us to do in terms of those findings? Do you want us, you want us to have the auditor and administration come to council and give a, the auditor what he <coughs> reported and then what administration reported? Or what is it that you're trying to get? What I'd like to see is that the NDE office tell us what their problem is in terms of delivering what they are mission to do. If it's the city attorney telling them, look, your effort at fixing A, B, or C won't pass legal muster, look, we ought to know that if that's the problem. Do we need to get a second opinion? I'm saying what we need and should be our priority in the midst of an economic crisis with one out of four persons in this city in poverty, then black businesses hire black people like white businesses hire white people. It's not 100% either way. But that one, that part is being excluded as long as we dally talk about some procedure when we need to fix the problem. Now, I'm told that when we asked the audit, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the, the contractor to name his subs, his MBE participants, and then when it comes to signing a contract, we can't hold him to that. That's a problem. But I don't know that it's a problem we can't get over. I don't know that's a problem that's insurmountable. I don't know that a second opinion from a legal standpoint may not be uh, in order. But whatever it is, we ought to be concentrating not on some process of the auditor, but on the efficacy of that office. <coughs> I'd like to address <coughs> what Mark's talking about. We are tomorrow on the current education committee. We have a lot of folks that are very much involved in that. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. So, <coughs> starting tomorrow, well, tomorrow we have our current education meeting, and the agenda is to check the results of that audit and see where we go from here. Try to figure out what's the best method, because I've seen from the audit last week there are some things they, they have no control over. And is that something we can give them control over? Are they doing the um, Section 3 correctly? Are we meeting these guidelines? So, so we're going to look into it, exactly what you're talking about and try to get a reasonable grasp of it and try to figure out what's the best way to go forward with it. Would no. it be with the city attorney or whatever? But we, we're definitely looking at what you're talking about and, and can come back to you all and discuss our findings. Well, you're welcome to sit in on meeting. You know? I fully agree with the <coughs> President that those things can be looked at, but the more you look at it, the more the same they are. That, oh, in fact, they're not doing them correctly. Nobody's doing them. How the authority's not doing Section 3 correctly? Nobody's doing it correctly. But there may be a requirement to put language changes uh, in the ordinance, local ordinance, that help facilitate getting yes. the problem solved. <coughs> that's, my point. that's what we ought to be looking at. That's what we're going to do. All that's right. exactly what we're going to do. Charles, I'm sorry. You've got to get it. So I got to say what I was going to say. Yep. Yes, did we, uh, let's see, during the, the audit committee, was there a, uh, <coughs> uh, you heard the report, and is that pretty much it for the function of the audit committee? Are they we're accepting the report and just leaving it at that? Or I appreciate that we are the governing body and we need to make some decisions about that, and I would, uh, Concur that we need to do this sooner rather than later. Uh, but uh, what was the? Were there any uh, findings of the audit committee uh, beyond the report and its response? Madam President, Ms. Robinson, I think that uh, what is important that we that we do first of all is that we we have um, the Department of Minority Business to give us their written response to the recommendations uh, that was in the audit. Um, they presented um, their 
positions as it relates to those recommendations, each one of those recommendations based on the um, incidents that came up as a part of the audit that resulted in the recommendation that came from the auditor. Uh, for example, the auditors, one of his recommendations was in regards to scoring, that there was a duplication in some way of how they went about doing the scoring. So the Office of Not Out of Business Enterprise responded to the, that as one of the reasons why he came up with that recommendation. But there were like four or five other, recommend, other issues that he includes in his audit that results in that one recommendation. Um, they address why scoring may not be the appropriate solution to all of the reasons for th that recommendation and how they address each one of those. Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps the first thing that we need to do is get that written response from the Office of Minority Business Enterprise. I also think that it needs to be incorporated into the audit document as the response because it was not attached to the final recommendation of the auditor, it of the audit itself. It was, well, it was verbal from the presentation there, and that's the reason why I'm saying that needs to be incorporated into the final document of the audit, which will answer some of the questions that as to what is being done and what is being done by the department as it relates to responding to the recommendations of the audit. In addition to that, I think if we want to have a special meeting for the purpose of discussing the audit and the recommendations from the administration, then certainly, you know, that's something that we should do. Um, but I do think that we need that. We need those responses so that we will not be, you know, you weren't there for a lot of their responses. Um, I can't say that I can recall everything that they said, you know, there because it's not, it has not been put, put to council. Well, it, go ahead, in respect to that, uh, and right, I think these things need to be in writing. I think that would be helpful for everyone. Uh, but I think that the question here is, uh, as Mr. Jewell put it, was, uh, or is, uh, what can we do to affect positive change in that area? And by positive change, I mean increase minority participation in city procurement uh, and uh, I'm hearing that the auditor recommended uh, a study and there seemed to be some controversy as the disparity study as to whether that was going to work and the legal opinion on it and, and I don't think we can operate the vacuum uh, without an answer on, on those two. Uh, Point. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can get that on. Um, do we have the agenda filled, Madam President, on uh, Monday? I would think Monday night, uh, this Monday. I would I would like to see us do this in two weeks because we do have all of these tax exempt papers this Monday. Well, okay. Well, and what I would, I would like, but I would suggest at that time, just to piggyback on what you're saying, I'm not trying to cut you off, is that we have. Um, the response is written and then presented from Minority Business to the audit at that meeting. And then also some more information on the study. I know that it's a diversity study. Um, the disparity study, sorry. <laughs> the disparity study. Of, I was close, so to the day. Um, that the way it was left at audit committee was that uh, Minority Business would go out and look at other communities that have had it done, uh, see what results were gotten from having it done, ch talking to legal, and then come back and come back to us because we have to pay for it and it's not cheap. Come back to us with that information, <laughs> Mr. Jewell. If I'm correct, I think they put a lot of that responsibility also <laughs> on the attorneys to work with us yeah. as well as getting that information so that. We won't have to be concerned as to whether or not the office of not out of business enterprise is making that recommendation to us independent of of legal. So it's really more in the legal Right. Uh, the, the fact is that there are pre tests that can be done prior to going into any major expense or the disparity study. 
Okay, so our state department is across the street can tell us how to get that done. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, there, there are things that we can do now to uh, facilitate uh, better outcomes out of that office. I keep saying, and, and, and if Rivers agrees, that uh, you've got those $50,000 in the low contracts that only require three quotes. Uh, those $5,000 and below contracts that only require to get up the phone and call, call in the contract and do the work, pre qualify. And, 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 and that that's where you can do your MBE work and grow businesses right now. She agreed and said the coal even helps her do that. And when I asked, well, why aren't you doing it? She says, well, we're waiting to get loaded in the DIT so that we can track it. The little we do it, you can track them with hash marks. And I'm saying, the things that we can do now, I don't want us to wait till October to get back at this issue. Um, when contracts are being signed every day. Um, if we can do all that you say with the caveat come Monday that we can also decide Monday whether we need to accelerate anything, I'm all for it. Okay. Now I'm attacking. Yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm on the same train over to OMB and our next steps on Monday. We're going to have some discussion of two weeks from Monday. We will have on big come to us. Okay. I'm only putting it off because it may be by the end of this meeting we'll have this so wrapped up that this isn't going to take any time at, at docket, so maybe we can do it this week. But I'm sort of trying to be flexible. Is that priority? That's <laughs> my paper. We can put that off for this. Uh, what's the what's the burning Priority for the tax exemption? I believe all the organizations that are sitting there waiting to find out whether or not the tax exemption. Of course they are. So we need to do this. Of course they are. We'll see what we get tonight. Yeah, then we'll have a better understanding of the time. Yeah. Right, so that then back to the original item, what we're expecting with the discussion of OMB and the is that they will come. We we have the documentation in terms of what responses have. Everybody's much more in interested it. for me, much more interested in where what it is that we're going to do. So, or have we started uh, the legal analysis that will let us ascertain whether or not it's fair to study uh, yeah. that makes sense? Or we do we have action plans for the rest of the items that pick up some of what uh, Marty's mentioned in terms of what we're doing? So that it's not just we already have the report. You think that so that when they come, they are you know talking about where we are in terms of addressing, even if that is uh, an act with an action plan on what's yeah. next. So I think that Ellen brought up an excellent point, and that is that we have not seen all the responses written. I would hope that we could get everything from MBE written and sent to council members in terms of yes we agree with these conditions so that we know where we are. Okay. Then have the MBE come to us at that meeting, explain their point of view on these recommendations with what they're going to do to change some of the way right. they do business the and they then we'll go forward from there. Okay. Okay. I didn't yeah. What was that presented that at the audit committee is not what you have seen as far as recommendations. Well, so we, got, we need to get that into well, this. We got like a written review. Okay. Right. We have not got the response. We have not. But it was given at the committee mm -hmm. meeting. It wasn't given in the writing. So once we get that, then we can move forward with any additional recommendations or actions that needs to be taken. And that still does not preclude the discussion about the audit process that bespeaks further refinement with administration and the audit. That's, that's a separate issue. Yeah. Yeah. Two different yeah. items. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got it.
say thanks for that clarification. You got yeah. something there, Bruce? No, no, I'm good. I'm ready to roll on to the next slide. <laughs> okay, you're hot. I know too. he's jerking us around. You're hot to uh, you know all these groups. Okay, just so we could try to make this um, move, move a little more smoothly, I'm gonna ask: Has everybody read yet the questions that have to be answered by the exemption um, applicants? Yes. Is this what we just received? We did. We've got, it's been floating around, but now we just got it to number two. The what? The, okay. I'm, the minutes. Each, each group that came forward. Okay. Do you want to take a minute and look at it? <coughs> did the money go in the report the next year and say what was in this, what they filled out when they did fill out? I mean, the committee. Well, we don't have, we have some notes from the committee on a few of the applicants, but not on all. We do have all, how all the votes went. But, we do not have... Jim, you want to walk us through it? You want to walk us through it? No, I'm going to do the intro. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the one that I have to ask the intelligent question. No. Um, so, what we had planned to do is uh, to bring a rents uh, who uh, work with the, uh, the exemption committee is going to uh, walk uh, through the applicable statute and ordinance with you um, the various criteria that uh, that apply to exemptions and then when she's finished with that uh, assessor Jim Hester is going to discuss um, the, the way the committee uh, the various things that the committee considered with respect to each of the applications. And then to pick up, I'm sorry, before you go, what I was ho I'm hoping we could do after you guys are done is that we're going to take these um, in order of owners, like as opposed to each property that Boaz and Ruth owns, we'll take them in a block. Okay, Charles? I'm okay with that, provided if there is a council member who thinks. One property falls in one category, and one property falls in Well, they have, I was just going to take all the same, all yeah. the group homes together, and then the retail on them. That's fine. Okay. All right. Are they classified as group homes? Mm -hmm. Good evening, Councilman. Mm -hmm. I do not have a question. Okay. Thank should have copies of the state code provision and the city code provisions by the fourth page document um, before you. Um, the state, as I mentioned, the state code sets out the parameters for um, authorizing or granting tax exemptions by designation. Um, in a nutshell, it's authorized local government bodies may grant exemptions for nonprofit organizations that use the, their property for certain exempt purposes set, set forth in section 58.1-3651. Subsection B of section 58.1-3651 um, provides the criteria or the considerations that local government bodies must consider before granting tax exemptions by designation. Um, so I'll just jump right into what those are. Um, under subsection B, there's a number list one through eight. Um, the first consideration required um, by the state code is whether the organization is exempt from taxation pursuant to section 501c of the Internal Revenue Code. The second consideration is whether um, the organization has a current ABC license for, the, for use on the property. 
The third consideration is whether a director, an officer, or an employee is compensated uh, above what one would usually expect for the services that are provided by that director, officer, or employee. The fourth consideration is whether any part of the net earnings of the organization um, and yours to the benefit of any particular individual, and whether any significant portion of the service provided by the organization is generated by funds from donations or from local, state, or federal grants. The fifth consideration is whether the organization provides services for the common good of the public. The sixth one involves whether a substantial part of the activities of the organization includes um, propaganda, uh, the carrying on of propaganda, or um, an attempt for activities that are targeted to influence legislation. The seventh item on that list is um, the consideration of the revenue impact on the locality and its taxpayers if the exemption is granted. And the last one is somewhat of a catch-all provision that allows local governing bodies to consider any other criteria that the governing body believes is necessary. Um, for granting the, the exemption. Um, that's, in a nutshell, the state code requirements. If you turn the page to the third page of the document, you'll see uh, section 98-249 of the city code set forth there. Um, that section provides the city code considerations that are based on um, the state code authorization that we just went over. Um, the first item um, in under section 98 to 49 is um, obviously the, the organization's written responses to the questions set forth in 58.1, 3651 that we just went over. The second item on this list was under the city code is the organization's written responses to several questions which are listed there under as A, B, C, and D. Um, a is whether the organization is current on all, on all obligations to the city whether the organization is in compliance with all city regulations. And the third question is whether the organization is qualified to receive a contribution from the city under any state statutes. And the fourth question listed there is whether the service provided by the organization is consistent with the city's mission and whether it is one that the city would provide if the requesting organization did not provide the service. And then the, and, and the last one is whether it meets, whether the the service meets an established priority of the city. Going back now to the actual list of considerations, another consideration, the third consideration is any pertinent financial records um, that the city assessor's office may request in the same gym. Jim will have, sorry, um, Jim will have um, more details um, about what that application process involves. Um, but just briefly, it, it includes a letter verifying that this, the organization is in fact exempt from taxation by the federal government according to 501c status. Um, any IRS 990s that have been filed, 990s, financial audits of the organization, and any financial statements of the organization. Um, and then lastly, um, the governing body or its council is to consider the property itself, whether it's real personal property that's relevant to the application. Um, and the, the certified use of, of the property for its purposes. Um, based on the information, or based on the, the required criteria the council is to consider um, under the state and city code, um, you may have gathered that there's a requirement that the organization submit some pretty detailed uh, tax and business information to the locality. Um, obviously, this is a public process because it's required to be reviewed by the local government body. Um, so, with that in mind, this is a public process and tax and business information that would otherwise be held confidential um, pursuant to state code, and specifically state code section 58.1-3, um, is subject to disclosure. Um, because of that, our office recommends that um, an announcement be made prior to the public hearing on these papers, which, which I understand will be Monday, um, notifying the applicants present in the chambers that they have an opportunity to withdraw their application if they do not want their private or confidential tax and business information discussed. Um, any other, if they fail to do that, they do not come forward and publicly withdraw their application, then that information may, may be subject to disclosure. Um, for any organizations that 
have an application before the city or have an, an ordinance before the city who have not, who did not attend the hearing on Monday, we would ask that you contact our office before asking any information of these organizations in the context of the public meeting. And the reason for that is because we want to be sure that the any confidential tax or business information is not inadvertently divulged and we want to have an opportunity to look, to review the question to, to just to consider whether there's any other way that it can be rephrased or any other way that we can get the information that we seek without violating or divulging the information that they may want to, to um, maintain private. Um, those are all the comments I have. Um, are there any questions? Oh, I do have one. Charles? Um, if an applicant <clears throat> was voted against at the committee level, would they have the ability to withdraw their application and reapply with additional information? I, they would, provided that they follow the, the deadlines that are already set forth in the city code. They, I mean, if they're, the committee does not believe that they're entitled to an exemption, they could reapply the next year. But it would only be for that next year, it wouldn't be for the year they were in place. Right. right. Okay. And the deadline for this past year is already gone. Right. Okay. Um, okay, that's my only question. Marty? Um, if we should grant any of these um, tax exemption, uh, do we have the uh, ability to terminate that forthwith? Uh, upon certain uh, terms and conditions or, uh, uh, or, or reversal of fortune? Yes, um, the exemption is conditioned on the use of the property um, for the purpose that's set forth in the ordinance. If the organization fails to use the property in compliance with that ordinance, then they may be subject to revocation of the exemption. Um, that, again, Jim may be able to speak in more detail to that, but there is a triennial application process that city assessor's office engages in um, so that app or organizations who already have an exemption can submit an application recertifying their exemption per exempt purpose um, if it's determined that they are no longer using their property within the confines of the ordinance and their exemption could be revoked. And that would be a process, in other words, once they grant it, uh, they continue until which time someone raises an objection. It, yes, it would continue until some other law or some other action by the city terminates. Uh, the reason I'm asking, it, I don't know how we got here, but because granted other members here might have uh, exemptions to be made, but I'm trying to save the bird theater from me. <laughs> that's how we got here. That's how we got here, Marty. But exactly, but hold still a minute. <laughs> Uh, because they, 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 uh, the building was purchased or converted to a foundation, nonprofit foundation. But secondly, the nonprofit foundation is struggling so that uh, uh, it represents a hardship. Now, I haven't heard anything in these provisions discussing anything about a hardship as one of the criteria for tax exemption. You got some. You got paid some nonprofits that are rolling in dope. You've got some nonprofits that have a good time lobbying over here in the General Assembly. Uh, I didn't want to get caught up in all of that. I'm saying here's a, here's a building that's looking at a hardship. If the light should go out over there, that would be like a jack o' lantern tooth missing in uh, a, a very uh, 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 prosperous carry town. <laughs> neighborhood. Um, and where you see hardship? Any criteria, facts, circumstances that governing body deems pregnant? Right. Uh, well, that ought to be listed out. You got everything else listed but it. Um, why would we give an exemption to organizations that's rolling in the door? Well, Bert's going to go through this and Rolling in the See who's rolling and who isn't rolling. <laughs> <laughs>
Exercise for the criteria to be established that a hardship is should be a criteria. Primary. 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 No. Why else are we doing? That's not what you're saying, Mr. Patron. That's, that's what I meant. Oh, we're gonna go. We're gonna go through these and the criteria that we have in front of us. May I ask one? <laughs> yes, sir. Jesus Christ! <laughs> Just a second here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I believe this should be directed towards Miss Rents. Uh, these are all factors that could be considered, but you don't have to give an affirmative action to, excuse me, an affirmative answer to any of these questions. Is that? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So we could say, you know, we don't care if you're exempt from taxes. We're, we're going to grant you this exemption. We don't care if you're serving alcohol on the premises, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are criteria and these, so as a student, the city has not established, we can just take these into consideration whether you need to answer a question in a certain way or you're, or you're out. We just, right. that's a consideration. Right. Because the state code doesn't indicate which way the local government should decide those issues. It just requires a few consideration. For instance, but they didn't tell us what to do. However, they should be. Oh, right, let's do one at a time. I think Alan is up in The only criterion that you cannot ignore <laughs> is that it must be a nonprofit organization that serves certain specific uses or makes certain specific uses of property. Other than that, all the other factors that Brita went through are factors for you to give such weight as you think is appropriate. Okay, so let's see. And all of these are nonprofit organizations. So what's before you is what weight to give to the various factors. Okay. Under, looking under the state code here, it says shall consider the following questions. I'm missing the verbiage where it says that it requires that that be such an organization. It's in the paragraph A. Okay. Doug, you have a question? Yeah. Is it also what if a particular organization is not current on their um, emissions tax to the city? That's something that the committee or the council can consider. Again, and I believe that is a consideration under the city code, uh, under subsection 2A. <laughs> yeah, 2A. Um, so, again, it's a consideration. It follows the same spirit of the state code language, which means that it can be considered. It, it must be considered. It doesn't indicate one way or the other, which way it should come down. Well, Bruce, well, I think Bruce had a question, and then Marty. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if it needs to be directed to the attorneys, but if my memory serves me correct, and Mr. Hester, you may need to answer this, we are talking about tax exemption with these papers for the June and December tax papers. Is that correct? This was the first batch that came through from the time that we Past the orders. Is that correct? If we had been in proper sequence, these filings would have been made by September 1st of 2011. Right. And if approved, and probably it would have been approved after the fact, we would have had to have abated taxes back to January 1, 2012. So the January payment would have been refunded, and hopefully we put in place a uh, Stop the So it is actually the January and the June payment we're talking about because we are now past right. the June payment on this. And so all these organizations have paid this money by 
in order to meet their obligations. Um, the second part of this is, is that in the 2013 budget, I believe we allocated $250,000. We, we, we subtracted $250,000 from the budget to handle this situation. If my memory serves me correct, we had some we had some conversations about this because there was a concern about how much it was going to be. It was going to be millions of dollars or was it going to be 50 cents? And we had the staff do a study and we came away and I think the number we landed on was roughly, we saw a revenue decrease of approximately $250,000. So I know for the 2013 budget we have dollars set aside. Now the question is, I know we have a surplus for the 2012, and obviously if we pass any of these papers, that means the finance department will have to amend their, their uh, preliminary estimates, which are of course moving until you get all your final data. But they would need to <coughs> recognize that, and as, as we sit here tonight, if my memory serves me correct, we were talking about approximately two to three billion dollars and uh, 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 income over expenses for the 2012 FY year. So I, I'm trying to make sure we're all on the same page on this. So, and, and so that I just want to make sure. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Jewell. E either way, it, it came to some real ridiculously low number. Um, uh, assuming that we adopt all of it, I don't know that that's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly agree with that. Um, um, but but my other question had to do with uh, um, again. I'll take the very theater. We've got a, a not-for-profit who now is purchasing the building but leases it to the theater operator who operates the theater. They pay, the foundation pay all of its uh, uh, real estate and personal property taxes, as I understand it, but the operator has not paid all of his admissions taxes and perhaps sales taxes. Yet, it looks like the foundation is being held responsible for taxes that aren't theirs, and therefore was recommended against. Now, uh, this, Mr. Hess is here, he can clear that up to me. And, and, and as to whether that's accurate or not, uh, but if in fact it is, then um, can I didn't bargain for all this. But it's here now, and we're just going to have to put group game, game rules on the table. Yeah, and we will, Mr. Jewell, we're going to get ready to go through this list, and when we get to the Bird Theater, you're going to have your opportunity to go for it. So, this is advanced lobbying. I, and this is advanced <laughs> lobbying, and I'd just like to say one thing about it, and that is that two things. This year, the request is for, um, actually, what I have in front of me is not correct. This is 101, but it's higher than that for this year. That number is going to increase every year. And one of the things, I'm not saying we shouldn't do everybody or not do everybody, but if we do somebody in this because we just feel like it's a good cause and maybe it's a good thing to do, Whoever falls into that designation will be back next year asking for the same benefit that we gave somebody else. So I think we need to keep it in, in the backs of our mind because as Mr. Tyler would say, we are talking, even though small, we're talking about taxpayers' dollars here in a very tight budget. So I'm just, I'd just like to put that out there as we move forward. Uh, Mr. Jewell? Oh, evidently I'm behind the eight ball because I'm not sure what criteria we're going to use to make any decisions. Have we? That's what we have, Mr. Hester here. Okay. And clearly, if we don't put limiting criteria in place, exactly what you say is going to happen, 
Lottie Dottie there, everybody's going to show up wanting to have their package exempted. Mm -hmm. When, that ain't what I bargained for. <laughs> All right, Mr. Hilbert and then okay. Mr. What I heard Ms. Rent say earlier was that as long as, once an exemption is granted, that as long as someone uses the property in the uh, right. way that it was exempt or approved the exemption, that it would take a change in that use of property before it could be revoked. There's no other reason for which this could be revoked in the future. Well, I, I don't want to say that there's no other reason, but the reasons that I'm aware of that I'm most familiar with it. If, I'm sorry, have we ever ruled anyone not in compliance with this? Yes. We have withdrawn some. Are we at liberty to to say who that is or? Well, I don't. I don't know that we have the liberty to do that outside of of, of the, the exemptions that we have that are before us. Um, but I think that the gentleman have that information to find out who was. Has it been more than one organization? <coughs> Has it been more than one organization? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. And Jim could correct me if I'm wrong. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam. The question yeah. was similar to Mr. Culbert's whether or not we would be approving this in perpetuity if they didn't change the use of the, um, the building. But you're saying triennially we're able to, so we could <coughs> intentionally, prospectively say this is only for three years on the assumption that the crisis is not permanent, but a crisis that will be resolved. The ordinance, the, the ordinance that are the ordinances that are before you condition the continued exemption on the use, the exempt use as required by state code. So if it's not used in accordance with that ordinance, then so we would have to have a state code change in order to say we want to. No, no. The, the state code language um, is 58. Uh, Point one of um, says the ordinance shall state the specific use on which the exemption is based and continuous of the exemption shall be contingent on the continued use of the property in accordance with the purpose for which the organization is classified as in this case the designation. So our ordinance is already written to indicate that it's the organization is entitled to the exemption as long as it's used in accordance with the exempt purposes. I have that, but what I'm trying to get to, if an organization, I'm using this in case scenario, the organization is in crisis. And so it will be, I don't know, three years of opportunity to have such an exemption, but not in part two. Where do we have, or can we have, to say that we are giving this only for three year periods? In retrospect, we're saying you're done, doing fine, you're rolling in the dough, and we're going to wipe up your exemption. That, you mean whether or not we have So in other words, we're granting an exemption for a limited period. That's correct. I don't think that we have the authority to do that. That's what I'm saying. We require a code change. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Hester. Thank you. In April of this year, we held two, two days of public hearings in response to a, an ordinance change by City Council where you uh, reenacted the uh, tax exemption by designation process. That had been in advance uh, since uh, the spring of 2007. <coughs> uh, normally, you make the application uh, <coughs> under the guidelines on September 1. And we prepare the public hearing in the early part of the following year. Uh, any that are approved are retroactive to the January 1 land bill. Because this, this year was circumvented, we, we sort of had to push through this process very quickly. We actually went out and solicited organizations that had been in contact with us uh, to see if they wanted to proceed with the exemption on short notice. Uh, it required a rewriting of the uh, exemption application, the guidelines for the committee. We had to find new committee members, which was 
difficult, especially on short notice. Uh, we managed to do this and and get the uh, public hearing going in the middle of April. Um, <clears throat> 29 properties applied for the exemption. The normal process is that once the application is made and it's reviewed, it's sent to the city attorney's office to confirm that they and that that organization or property owner did in fact have a right to go before the designation process. Uh, because it was a, a short-circuited process, we had 29 applications pushed to the public hearing, uh, only later to find out three of those were actually for-profit ownerships. So we had to withdraw those. You don't have those for you today. In a normal year, that would not happen. Of the 26 properties that are before you today, uh, each organization representative was allowed to come to the public hearing. They were to answer in advance these state mandated questions, the city mandated questions in writing. And uh, the city attorney's office and our office reviewed the other criteria related to uh, their exemption status, particularly at, at the IRS level, which is nothing more than federal income tax, which people often like to tax with the others. They're totally unrelated. But we were using it as a piggyback measure the process that the IRS had put in place, if we could, that uh, basically confirmed uh, that they were a nonprofit and acting in a nonprofit manner. Some of the organizations are not 501c3, which is a normal classification. That doesn't mean they can't get a local designation, uh, but it just makes more steps uh, out there for us to have to go through. Um, each applicant uh, filled out an application. We asked a standard uh, set of questions and asked for a standard set of submissions. Most of it related to their federal income tax guidelines, their financial papers. Um, you can read those on the first two pages. Uh, basically declaring to us their position. Uh, some of the organizations are different that we're really looking for a sense of uh, what it is we need to talk to specifically. After that, they came to the public hearing. Uh, they had pre-submitted their answers to the uh, required questions, uh, but it was open for uh, a reinterpretation, a re-questioning. Uh, re uh, the applicants may to get more clarification. Uh, sometimes the answers are short, two or three sentences, and you don't really get a sense uh, of what it's about. So we had that opportunity, and if it opened up any additional questions that the committee felt was relevant, situation that they could ask me at that time. Um, they, uh, they did this in a very uniform manner. Uh, they held their decisions until the second day. I think the reason they voted to do that is because so many of these applications this year were related to group home situations. And group homes does not fall under one small category. It can be private, public. Uh, the funding is different. Uh, the expenses are different. So <clears throat> that, that's really a catch-all that really doesn't explain that particular situation. Uh, I've listed the properties uh, on the following sheet. I have down at the, uh, the bottom of each property number, uh, there's a note there issued. I, I want to state up front that this is my observation of the committee reaction. Uh, sometimes the committee members ask questions on certain properties, sometimes they didn't. So I don't know what was going on in their head when they made their vote, uh, but uh, they were all giving, uh, given an opportunity to ask any questions that they wanted to on each property. Uh, you'll see a committee vote there. Uh, of the 26 that did, did pass the uh, uh, initial qualifications, they only approved two. Uh, most of them were uh, an 04 and 05 vote, where the committee as a group did not feel that the explanation from the organization rose to the level of giving them an exemption at the expense of all the other taxpayers in the city. So we have grouped these for your benefit. Uh, the largest group is Boaz and Ruth. Uh, and you'll notice uh, that I did put the committee vote. Uh, one of our members is actually an accountant for Boaz and Ruth. So you see an 04 vote. 
be uh, if we had the same for voting. Uh, all the other uh, cases were voted on by all five members. Um, the, the issue of the group home was something uh, they just could not resolve. Uh, whether a group home rose to the level of uh, totally exempting them from all the real estate taxes. Uh, you'll see that predominantly through the explanation. Uh, in Boaz and Ruth, they have a, a high number of single family homes that they they basically rent on a per room, on a per room basis, uh, which makes it very similar to a boarding house. They collect the rent weekly, and uh, in the committee's opinion, the gross rents that they were collecting on a monthly basis far exceeded what the home would rent for as a single family uh, residence, which is a, so I'm sure they have SUPs that allow them to operate in the family. One of their properties is a commercial building, uh, which is operate, which they operate a commercial enterprise. Uh, I don't think it's what you call a financially successful financial enterprise, but the fact is Martha does keep that uh, uh, antiques business in, and it's serviced by clients uh, as the employee. Um, that's pretty much the situation with the Boaz group. Let's, let's, you've got more on Boas and Ruth, but let's do the Boas and Ruth and then let's do each category at one more time. I think that might work a little bit. There's only two sub-levels sub for Boas and Ruth. You've got one retail building and all the others are basically a group home. In the group homes, as you say, they're individual houses that she has subdivided into rooms and rents. Uh, she leases them on a per room basis. Okay, any discussion on that? <coughs> yeah, it does. I would say that you really need to create a job to rent these houses for market rent or exceeding market rent. Why would you do that? That was the general response from the committee. Bruce, you had something? Oh. I'm trying to understand, and maybe Mr. Connor hit it, are these properties being rented to individuals that are part of a program that Boaz and Ruth are doing, or are they being rented to folks like us who can pay fair market value, or are they, what, you know, what are they doing with these properties in particular? My knowledge, uh, she only rents the rooms to people who have entered into this contractual arrangement in her organization. So there are individuals that are party to Boaz and Ruth? Yes. They are individuals that are going through their program? Yes. Okay, and they are, so are they renting them at market rates? Are they renting them, I mean, I'm trying to understand the, the value property in relationship to the rent and whether or not it's if it's, if it's a minimal a minimal amount of money they're asking for to but they're giving them a place to, to come and be associated with individuals who are going through the same issues they're going through and this is used as part of their therapy or part of their programming I'm trying to understand you know it, it doesn't sound like it's a real unit where I can just show up and say I need to get a room instead. So it's, is it part of the program, I guess, is the real question. And do they stay just when they're in the program, or do they continue to stay there after they're out? She didn't have an answer for that part. And you said she did not? She did not. They can't stay after. Uh, she's a caretaker. And part of this is providing them a nice, clean place to live. Uh, and keep them close at close paths. I think all of that is important in, in the function that she operates under. Um, uh, generally, and the, the prices are all over the place. And, and I think it's uh, I think she charges on an ad need basis. Uh, somebody can't can't afford you know the seventy five dollars a week or whatever for a full service room. Then I'm sure that she works for them. Uh, but generally, the, the market, if that home was out available to the public, uh, 
Uh, most of our homes are in that seven to eight hundred dollar a month rental range, and she uh, she was collecting gross uh, twelve to fourteen hundred dollars. However, she's paying all the utilities uh, and all the expenses, any other expenses to go with that property. And in some cases, she had a higher vacancy rate than the normal market. So there's just a lot of uh, interaction. I know exactly what this is, and I think we experienced it, uh, Cynthia, when we were working with Second Chance. Uh, she served at the uh, DOC pays $55 per year. That's $350 a week, roughly $14, $15 a month per room. Per room. And that's a sizable chunk of money when you've got four, five, six rooms per house. Now, look, what Martha does is utterly magnificent with the programs that she runs over. And perhaps some of that money gets to pay some instructors who run classes. Uh, she does the farming training. They're trying to beat her up. I'm telling you, there is no shortage of revenue generated in those houses at $55 a day. Uh, $45 for <coughs> parolees, not still connected to DOC. No, 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 $55. $55 might be... $55 a day, I'm, I'm jumping in. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm saying group homes ain't poor. I can tell you that. Now, it just happens that Martha Rollins runs programs above and beyond just mere housing. And so, um, uh, I don't want us to get stuff twisted. That's the reason I'm saying that we ought to be able to establish whether we're dealing with hardship. Otherwise, what reason are we giving a tax exemption? Oh. Wait a minute. Thank you. Chris, I just end up. And, um, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Hester, I think you had indicated that your comments were relative to what you believe that you heard and you were and these were not expressed out loud. The objections or the issues I think that you have listed necessarily. Uh, as I understand it, the Virginia Supportive Housing uh, uh, developments are not group homes but are actually individual apartments. Is that, uh, is that not right? I believe in most or all cases they're individual. There are individual units. Then, so if they're really individual units, I mean, a group home to me is bedrooms of which multiple bedrooms are assigned to one bathroom. However, if you have a self-contained unit, that being a kitchenette, a place to sleep, I mean, it could be a studio apartment and a bathroom, those are self-contained units, are they not? And to me, by that definition, they are not group homes. I mean, that's that's the way I would look at it. But you're 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 talking about Virginia supportive housing. Just right. their development. Well, let's stick to Boas and Roof over oh, here. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. That you can throw it out again when we get there. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. Sorry for the. Uh, but that's okay. I'm just for getting out of sequence. I'm just trying to stick with Boas and Roof. Here. Okay. Uh, please. Thank you. I, well, first of all, Mr. Jewell is right. You know, I, I don't think these folks are charging fifty-five dollars a day. What was the number you were coming up with, Mr. Jewell? Fifty-five dollars from DOC, forty-five dollars from the probation office. All right. Do that happen per day? But but my point is, how much is Boaz and Ruth charging for the room? I don't know, but I know. But I mean, I mean, they're clearly not charging fifty-five dollars thirty days at sixteen hundred and fifty uh, sixteen hundred and fifty dollars. I don't suspect they're charging. Yes, sir. You think they're hand? They're getting sixteen fifty. Yeah, as long as they stay there, that's what they're getting from DOC. I, I find that hard to believe. Um, you check it out. All right, well, we're going to. But the point is whether <laughs> whether they get fifty-five dollars a day, well, or just the same one thing, or forty-five dollars a day, or forty dollars a day. To me, what we're trying to wrestle with here is, do we give, yes, this is a great cause, 
Yes, she does great work. Is she taking in more money than she would be if she were renting it as a single house? Yes. Okay. Do we want to give her the tax exemption because she does good work? Do we, or uh, even if she makes a profit of doing good work? Or do we not? That's sort of to be the bottom line. Well, I think, if I may, mm -hmm. first of all, the first question I have, are there other non-profit organizations that are doing the same thing that we have already accepted in the past? I mean, that's the first question I have is, are we already doing this? You know, it's like, it's like I feel like we're, we're holding some folks up to a higher standard than we have done in the past, and it's because of the, the, just the timing of the conversation. I think what you have to do, and Ms. Graziano, I think you're absolutely correct, you have to look at the organization, and you have to look at what they're doing for this city. And is Boaz and Ruth, bottom line, doing something on behalf of our city, which is beneficial to our community, and in the long run, benefits the, the city of Richmond governmental structure. And when I look at Boaz and Ruth and whole, I have no doubt that what they're doing as a whole is something we should be encouraging, and we should be applauding them and thanking them for what they're doing as opposed to trying to figure out how to get into their back pockets. So I'm in your camp when it comes to the broad brush conversation and I feel that at this point in time, if they have a, if they're making money off these houses, I know they're losing money elsewhere doing doing the small programs when you look at it in a whole. And I say we need to move this group of papers forward and not worry about it. I suspect we are already uh, providing uh, housing uh, uh, housing for other nonprofit organizations without us paying taxes, without them paying taxes. And, and I hear what you say, Mr. Tyler, and I would agree with you 100%. If we are doing it with other nonprofits, then we should be doing it with this one. If we are not doing it with other nonprofits, is it a precedent that we wish to set so that any organization that is nonprofit that is providing this service would be given the same opportunity to be tax exempt? Mr. Samuels? That is exactly the point. It's good for the goose, good for the gander. And until we know the answer, we can't go by suspicion that it's happening. And we can't make a decision that we think it's not happening. We need a yes or no answer before we can make a decision on this section of, of one of those things. So that means I would say we skip over this one and move to the next one until we can get that answer. I'm sorry, I'd like to give them the opportunity today to have a decision made, but I think we have to have an answer to that question before we make a decision on these. Right. I hate to pass it down a month, but I don't know what else to do. And uh, Mr. Carlin, Mr. Tyler, and Ms. Robinson. Very briefly, have we you know, granted this exemption to people that have the same situation more than all that they have around me, that meets market or exceeds market? Have we, do, have we done that in the past? Um, I'll defer that question to Jim. <laughs> yeah. I can think of one for sure, and I believe it's a uh, ownership of uh, Virginia Support of Housing on the East End, and there may be a couple others, but that would it'd be a small group oh. that came in uh, with people with the answers here. So, uh, but, uh, uh, those, those exemptions came in, in uh, right after the, the statute change, statutory change. Uh, where the General Assembly passed it down to the local governing body. Okay. Mr. Tyler, you had something? Well, I was going to say, uh, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Mr. Samuels said we need to get the information. We, we really do need to get the factual information on you know, how many groups are we already doing this mm -hmm. for. Figure this out. Mm -hmm. You know, the reality of all the dollars we're talking here, we, 
we have, it's not a large sum of money in comparison to some of the other tax breaks we provided other folks. So, but I want us to make sure we have. I mean, I mean, Ms. Robinson, truly, I mean, I, I can name multiple. Tax uh, breaks for for profits, not for no, nonprofits no, for, as well. For nonprofits, and, and I mean, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you. Um, You've got organizations that are have millions of dollars worth of assets and pay zero dollars in, in real estate tax in the city of Richmond, and they're nonprofit organizations, and they serve this community. So, I mean, oh, yeah. oh, tons. Maybe. Children's Hospital. An organization has a tax exemption that's written into the Virginia Code. The Virginia Home for the Incurables has a tax exemption. State. That's state. Virginia yeah. Home is not state. So, yeah, no, no, absolutely no. not. It's a nonprofit organization. So no. anyway, so there yeah, again, they're again from my perspective. There are some, but we have, we do have some that are exempted by the state, but we're not dealing with those today. Up we're until up in, well, Virginia Home, I mean, so Children's Hospital, even though they've merged in, I'm not sure that that property is owned by the state. It's owned by a foundation. So anyway. For what it's worth, Department. I, I appreciate what Mr. Point. Sanders said. Ms. Robinson? I too. Well, I, th I think there, there are a couple things that I'm a little concerned about as to how we go about making a recommendation based on the overall assessment that has been done by the committee versus um, our analysis based on which one of these nonprofits that we may be aware of, we may, you know, uh, favor what they're doing, we feel very good about what they're doing because we're very in touch with some of them, whereas some of these nonprofits, you know, I don't even, I'm not, I don't know that I could say that I know who they are. Um, but this process has been opened back up, and so every year we're going to have nonprofits submitting applications. And we have a board that is reviewing a whole lot more information than what we're looking at, making a recommendation to us to support something like that based on their overall assessment. Um, I think we can resolve whatever we're dealing with here, but we need to, I think, go back and look at this criteria, how this board is going to make recommendations to us, because at the end of the day, there is going to be somebody on this council that likes every nonprofit that comes through here. Right. And either we need to set a ceiling as to how much we're going to give out every year and how we do that, as well as the uniformity of the criteria. It cannot just simply be because an organization is doing a good job, because most nonprofits, if they're doing what they're mission to do, is doing a good job and they're doing a service that the city wants to see them do. And so, you know, I think that's part of the reason why we appoint boards to do these kind to do this full analysis for us. And I don't think it's I don't think that we can independently just make a decision based on one criteria. Now Boaz and Ruth and every piece of property that we are looking at here is located in the sixth district. And they are also located within a few blocks of where I live. There is a lot of concerns as it relates to the community as to how many group houses we put in any one section of the city as well. And there is some concerns as it relates to the fact that the rent that is charged is far than 30% of the income of the families, of the residents that live in the units. And these people are struggling to be able to even put food on their tables in the process. So there's a whole big story in this process. It doesn't take anything away from whether or not this is a good, valid service. It is a very good, valid service. And what is being done in the rehabilitation process and perhaps that's where the funding goes to help support the operation. This business is just as hard times, Marty, as what you're talking about with the theater. They are. I, I they are 100%. So, you know, if we want to deal with hardship, 
They meet the criteria for hardship. Look. Well, this song mm -hmm. means so. Well, uh, Never, go ahead. Well, I'm just confused here to a certain extent about the criteria that we're using. Uh, this, you know, quote unquote good work and so forth, that's just undefined. Uh, uh, I think there's some very good organizations out here. Uh, this is a very, it's a very difficult issue, and I wanted to confirm the fact that I voted against uh, <laughs> lifting this moratorium, and I did. Uh, and I'm uh, just very concerned about this. It seemed like to me that the patrons of these papers, uh, and I guess in this case there's only one, would look to us for a budget cut or something like that so we can keep in balance. Now, Mr. Tyler has indicated that we set aside 200000 so this falls within that, so I'm not sure that that's necessary in this case. But uh, I'd be willing to look at some of these if we close the door again. Uh, I just don't want an endless stream of folks coming in here asking us for a tax exemption. And I feel like it was bad policy to open this up. I still feel that way. But I'm willing to consider some of these if we'll close the door after this. After this? Okay. After this. Mr. Gill? With all due respect to my friend over there, God don't bless him. He is. God gonna bless you, boy. <laughs> Let me tell you We're talking about a, a ceiling of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. This is a mere pendant to a fifteen million dollar uh, uh, personal property tax on. Bill uncollected. I can't even learn. Mr. Jackson, have we sent the billing out for that fifteen million dollar commercial personal property tax yet? Yeah, we billed all, which is not collected. How long ago? I don't know exactly. I just heard two weeks ago when the audit came out April, the first week of April. You wanna raise hell about something? Talk about that. What are we talking about? Two hundred fifty thousand right, dollars for these many. Let's get back for these many groups, and and we're going to have heartburn. I'm not having heartburn. You're having something burning. <laughs> <laughs> something burning over there. I can't I'll, wait to hear that one. In the I'll debate you over who's more indignant about the fifteen million dollars not being collected. I'll be telling you that I am extremely upset. All right, but, but can we get? Okay. Let's get back to Boaz and Ruth, if we could. And what? What? What I, what I heard, I thought I heard. I thought that, hundred million dollars in the rainy day fund. Your man put it. I thought I heard Mr. Tyler agree that we would hold off on these group homes until Monday when we can get information on will we be setting a precedent or not. He said, That's he correct. Said, and, well, and okay. Madam President, just I don't know how many other folks fall in that category. Are there and, different kinds of group homes? Well, and, uh, and I guess the question I have is do we need to make sure that we have those same questions answered or we, do we need to go through each one of those individually? I think let's, let's go to each one and see okay, what, fine. because some of these group homes, as you and Mr. Joe have said, these group homes deal with felonies. Some of these group homes deal with handicapped or impaired people. It seems to me that whenever we don't know what to put, what category it should go into, it goes into a group home. And I think at some point we're going to have to define what it is you mean by group home or have the different types of group homes defined. That's not for us to do today, but it's clearly, clearly something we're going to have to do. Yes, one question. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hester. I'm sorry. 
Well, I wanted to follow up on Bruce's statement where he is asking for a retrospective look to see if we have funded similar entities in the past. I'd like to have that same question answered relative to child care centers, which there's an entity well, we get to across all categories. Yeah. So we have a look. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ms. Robertson. Mr. Hester, as it relates to Boaz and Ruth, the particular properties that we are looking at fits into the criteria of satisfying their nonprofit status. That's not an issue as it relates to whether or not these properties fit into their nonprofit. No, okay. they're definitely nonprofit. Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to put Boaz and Ruth's group homes on for Monday when we have better information. However, how about Boaz and Ruth, their retail building? Have any, uh, what was the finding on that? Uh, the, the committee committee turned, recommendation. The committee turned it down, but I believe the vote was two to two. Mm -hmm. No we, majority. Do we know how, why? What's this? What's this? Uh, it seems to be a, a mixed use property. She has a retail facility and part of it. She also has a back room where has, she has some computers set up, I recall, <laughs> that's available to the clients. Uh, there is some job counseling that goes on. Yeah. Maybe some other uses. Okay. So she uses it's a small to, part of the So she sort of uses the profits from the sales of her furniture to support what's going on in the other sections of that building. Yes. Okay, yes. so is your feeling that this should be tax exempt? Yes, sir. On a dollar or any of that junk she sells over there, half of it <laughs> is half of it is <laughs> it is not junk. Right. It's not junk. Uh repurpose. Is that what you said? Repurpose. Repurpose. I like that. Uh, but most of it is used stuff. Um it's been shined up and she's not making a ton of money off that stuff and she does she rolls it right back in the program. Um, uh, this lady makes stuff happen with uh, bail, wire, and bubble gum. Uh, I don't know how any of us would know how to do all that. But she finds a way to do it, so I ain't got no problem. I, I don't care. Okay, is that, any, is that a consensus or is there a disagreement with that? Are we awaiting the additional information? That's on the group homes. This is not a group home. Oh, you mean just on the I'm just talking about the retail section. section. Oh. Okay, so what, what my proposal would be, or my suggestion would be, is that all of those that we determined today, or even on Monday, that would be tax exempt, they will go on the consent agenda. And those that we feel are not going to be approved would go on the regular agenda. Does that make sense to everybody? It gives everybody a chance to say why they want the paper that if, wasn't recommended. Exactly. Mr. Jill, are you minutes. leaving before we get to the bird theater? I got two civic meetings. I'm between the rock and all. All right, let's we'll do the bird theater next. Thank Just be, and you know now you Just owe me on. one. <laughs> okay, it's a yes. On. Oh, God bless you, child. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the bird theater. Now, I have. Well, I think if we have sort of opened the discussion on the bird theater. But my question is to you, Mr. Jewell, yes. on the bird theater, it's my understanding that the foundation has a lease that requires the tenants to pay the taxes. No. The foundation owns the building. Right. And then it leases it out to an operator who right. operates the building, shows movies, and sells Popcorn. But I have here that, that right. the lease, is that correct, Jim, that the lease requires the tenant to pay the taxes, and the tenant, who is a for-profit, has not paid the taxes. Which, which item are you on? Like I'm on the Bird Theater Foundation. I know it's Bird Theater. What number? Oh. 26. Property 26. Okay. Property 26. Okay. 
So my, I guess what I'm wondering is, does the foundation have no recourse against the tenant to make him pay the money for those taxes? My understanding, help me out, Jim, that the Bird Theater Foundation pays the real estate tax and personal property tax, which would be all that they would normally have to pay, except you got operations in there, and that the operator is supposed to pay the admissions tax and the sales tax on goods. Right? Does that sound right to you? Uh, there is a clause in the lease between the foundation and the operator that says the operator will reimburse the foundation for the real estate taxes. So the obligation, of course, is the foundation. Right. The operator is to reimburse. Which but the op yeah. do. And they pay them. But the operator is not paying them, it is the problem. Well, the real estate tax is paid by the foundation. Right. But That's but, done. But the lease says that the operator is supposed to reimburse the foundation for the tax money, is my understanding. And the operator is, for lack of a better word, stiffen them. Is that what? On, on the tax money. But, but what does that have to do with the taxes being paid? Taxes no. are being paid. Right. So I'm, that should not be a disqualifier. Okay. Right. right. I let it be on the record that I agree with Mr. Jewell. Oh. Hey, my friend, my I friend. mean we can't get into it uh, we can't get into every lease here as to who's paying what. I mean that'll take forever on these things. Uh, it seems like to me that if they're paid, they're paid, and that's kind of the end of the discussion. That's that's the foundation's issue if they can't collect they can't it from collect this operator. They have recourse of kicking them out. But that kind yeah, of seems operators. to be, I don't think this should be uh, uh, rejected uh, because the taxes aren't paid, because the taxes are paid. But it seems like to me that Mr. Jewell is saying, and I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but what I'm trying to, what I'm hearing you say is that's the cause for the hardship, and that's why you're bringing this up, is because the <coughs> lessee is not paying the lessor, not, no, uh, that's not the cause of the hardship. That's money to the profit. That's not the cause of the hardship. All right. The hardship <laughs> is the, the, the activity in that building that has generated revenue mm -hmm. has gone down significantly. Especially since this recession, but even before, uh, the building is in gross disrepair. The seats need to be replaced, and all that, uh, the, the, the that magnificent decorative interior needs to be cleaned up to a fairly well. The organ needs work. I mean, they got a ton of stuff that needs to be done, uh, uh, and so. Uh, uh, that's not the cause of their hardship. The cause of the hardship is that the, the foundation only was formed a year and a half ago, purchased this thing, and is struggling trying to make enough money to pay the mortgage on the one hand and carry this operator, which is a lesser concern on the other. Okay. Now I get it. But then they've got all of this upgrade to do uh, that they're struggling to raise the money. Yeah. Mr. Connor? <clears throat> yeah, two years ago, two and a half years ago, three years ago, a buddy of mine said, Where were you, man? He was their CPA. He called me one day and said, You know, he's like a problem. He said, You know, I looked over the, <clears throat> the bird theater books, and when I started reviewing things, I see where they did not pay their sales tax, not pay their admissions tax. And we want to take care of it. So I got him hooked up with finance, put him on a payment plan to do this. So I don't know how much that is, but I know that that's something that that's out there. And that, you know, we were working with them for Your company is working with them on to assist them. My friend, <laughs> my, my friend, is, is their CPA. Oh, they probably put together the, the nonprofit foundation. Oh, I got it. So, right. so this is about three right. years ago. Right. Well, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you that they have paid their so I don't know tax holidays. Is that true? Jim, I, may, I, may I ask one question on this? 
If we, I heard to break you say that the use of the building, as long as it continues to be used for that, that you would allow to be tax exempt. All right. Right now, the use of that building is for profit. It's a theater. No. The foundation owns a theater, but the use of the building is for profit, is it not? Well, I'm, just, okay. I'm, I'm asking to break it. Right. I think the way you characterize it, or at least I would characterize it, is that it's owned by a nonprofit organization. So then the question that I would then ask is well, what is the use that you're using right. it for? If it's used as a theater um, based on 3651, that might fall under cultural use. I'm not going against you, just no, stay I'm with just, me. I just need to add the fact that. <laughs> Uh, we know that they do a movie in there and that the operator does that. What the foundation does is put on performances uh, and, and do dance training with kids. Uh, so the foundation has a function uh, with the operation and then the uh, theater operator has a function. So to, to follow up on that question, so if we gave them uh, tax exempt status, and in three years, the foundation was not there anymore, or the theater was gone. We could just, then it would not be tax exempt. That's right. Okay. That's where I was trying to get. All right, well, in that case, since this is my opinion, <laughs> since this is a gem for the city of Richmond, since these guys are trying to save it, to me, I would say let them be tax exempt for three years. And it doesn't work or doesn't work. But we can't. We can't do it. Time. I, we can say they, they have to be. They have to come back in three right. years and reapply. Oh, yeah. They have oh, okay. to come back in three years. Oh, okay. 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 But no, okay. That, that helps. I think the way it works, the way it has worked in the past, is that Jim um, operates the triennial, the triennial application process, and depending on what information he finds through that process, he will either. Keep them on the tax exempt loans or take, put them back on the tax loans. Okay. So, there is, so in other words, it doesn't come back before the council. It's an administrative function that Jim But we're talking about it not being administrative. I think for me, what I was asking about was the three year where it came back for council review. No, it doesn't. And you're saying Presently, no, it doesn't. that it, at the end of the three year period, it can be administrative review and decision about whether or not to continue or to take it off and roll. Mm -hmm. Right. And it doesn't go back before and before. Right. It didn't right. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bruce? I, I was just going to say, I, I mean, you know, the reality is Mr. Hester it's works for us. If, he's, if he is not uh, following the letter of the law, we would be the first to know about it. And I think we have oversight of this. But I personally don't want us voting on this again. I mean, I want him to make a professional determination whether or not the real estate is being used properly. And if it is, it continues, and if it isn't. But it's still, yeah. I guess that's what I'm, what uh, I yeah. said was, let's yeah. give it to them for three years. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, it's, all, it, it's an automatic review, and then if it right. goes beyond that, it goes beyond that because they're continuing their mission. Is everybody good with that? Good with that. Yeah. Okay. And that's what any of uh, Madam President, I do want to say before I depart. No, no, wait a minute. We moved you up to the top of the line. You can't depart. We moved you up to the top of the line. We let you lobby before, during, and after for the bird theater. And now you have more to say? Well, uh, you just blessed me on the bird theater. I just wanted to thank you, number one. And, and say that uh, um, this is almost on the line of Commission of Architectural Review. It's almost in line with uh, the special use permit that we approved. It comes down to a political decision, either way you cut it. We're making a political decision right now. And so, well, there's a breaker switch, uh, but Jim is our breaker switch in three years. We, any one of us can, can dispute him and bring the paper back before council and fight it out again. So, um, I like the process. I think it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you do. And I thank you very much. I guess you do. Man, I got these. I got these two opponents working me like a 
Hi. Hi. I spent all day yesterday putting signs together. It's <laughs> They are making me like a Not white mob mule. Okay. I can't just whoop them. I got a bag. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Now, I'm the, I'm the next one, Virginia Supportive Housing. I'm going to let Jim address what this um, ADU is. But this is a situation, and that's what I'm saying, we need at some point to define a group home. The first one, I believe, is either for AIDS patients, I think that is what. The third one, I know, is for brain damage. Um, the third one being number 12. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, being number 12. Number 12 is brain uh, You may be able to fill us in a little more on that, but that's what I'm saying is if we really do need to have an idea of definitions for group homes. Oh, we wrote this down, it would loosely apply. I know, no, no, I know. That's because we don't have a really good, the good definition. The of housing, are, for the most part, are individual units that are there for group supportive activities. Uh, where one, one of the, as, as, as Graziano said, one of the set of units is for brain uh, damaged individuals. I think yeah, they follow HUD classifications, too, which you're probably familiar right. with, uh, veterans, uh, yep, sir, 55 and older, or some age group and older, and that type of situation. Right. Uh, and most of them are HUD programs. It's right. received top of funding. The one on Cherokee. Yes. Right. Yeah, and the one on Blakemore is um, age, age restricted uh, seniors. <laughs> the only, the only, uh, I mean, issue, um, disadvantaged seniors. The only issue the committee had other than the fact is we're in a position of having to exempt housing is that uh, uh, some of these groups, if not all, maybe it may have been eligible for the uh, LIHTC or ADU reduced assessment. Which is that close, so you have to do that. Uh, but application was never made, so we only have to for that. Is it too late? What did you say? No, and, and if, if these were not passed, we would have gone back to them to initiate that application process to see if I make, I make a recommendation then that we move past these, let Mr. Hester deal with that, and then see what the results are of that. For with the ACU? Because it could be reduced further yeah. through that. Yeah. Is it, well, let me ask a question. They're asking us, right. would the ADU reduced assessment reduce their tax to what, if they got tax exempt, wouldn't they get more off than the ADU? Yes. Well, if, yes, if we, uh, an exemption by designation is 100% exempt. Exemption. If we go through this uh, low-income housing mm -hmm. uh, valuation mm -hmm. process that we have to do if they qualify, mm -hmm. on the average, the assessments uh, citywide are reduced about 40 or 45 percent. Mm -hmm. May I bring up mm -hmm. another concern that I have? And I guess the question is, is there a process by which if someone makes an application we grant them tax exemption as a nonprofit. Another organization is denied, and they feel that their organization is similar and provide the same kinds of services as anyone else. Is there a potential lawsuit that they could uh, take against the city? I know there's always potential for lawsuits. And, so. and, and that's the best answer I can give you, is that there's always potential. Um, the kind of the kind of analysis that you're asking is one that's very, very, very fact specific. You would have to know to give a straight answer. I would have to know not only this entity but the entity that lives. All right. Let me. I want to raise another point mm -hmm. concern mm -hmm. as it relates to this. The Bird Theater. Um, There are ton, there are lots of nonprofits in the city, and Mr. Hester can attest to this, that looks for a reduction in value because they are providing 
affordable housing uh, or their rents are not market rates and those kinds of things so they want uh, their assessment to be reflective of that and some of them have hundreds of units of rental housing and they're all nonprofits and their clientele are all low-income clients and they're providing service to them by providing them affordable housing they are subject to be eligible to be considered as a nonprofit and every housing unit that they're providing is subject to fit within their nonprofit standards. Uh, in spite of the fact that those properties probably have their assessment reduced if they meet the criteria, uh, they probably are eligible to approach you for a full exemption yes, under the debt. Absolutely, because we validated that by the giving them a different assessment. Secondly, a for profit developer can provide low income housing, low income tax credit housing for low income people required to be that way for 15 years. Tons of units throughout the city could set up a foundation nonprofit to operate, and many of them do, that facility and would be subject to the same kind. And I just want us to be mindful of how if you want to structure your organizational piece, i.e. to make it work for you and have a for-profit in the midst of providing services and or if you're for-profit and want a non-profit because you're providing services for a specific population, it can be done. And so I really support and when we sit and make a decision based on whatever at this level versus what the board committee has recommended looking at all the information, we make, as Marty says, political decisions to grant exemption. The number of opportunities for nonprofits to come in with just some of those scenarios that I've already just, just mentioned, and you, we can just, we know the number of units that are there. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Tremendous. Um, I really would ask that the staff, and I'd like to support Mr. Hilbert's recommendation for a paper to put, a, put this moratorium back in place as well as for us to, um, look at what is what is possibilities as relates to ceilings because I think we're setting ourselves up for something that we have Mr. Thank you. Uh, did we did we make a decision that these will be considered single room occupancy or how are we or and some of these units aren't mm -hmm. I mean some of them contain bedrooms I, or are they all studios? No, they, no some, some, are are some of them are two half bedrooms with oh. shared baths. Okay. But all the rest of them are individual apartments. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I guess under that criteria, you've got two of them that may be group homes. And they're all permits for housing for the homeless, not just affordable housing. Uh, right, and I think that's a that's what I was going to bring up that that this organization we've talked about homelessness we've set that as priority to try and address homelessness so we've been working with that in the HHSE community excuse me committee to address homelessness it would seem like to me that we would be on firmer ground not not completely but it would seem like to me that if we're talking about a group addressing homelessness just versus affordable housing quote unquote that that would be a special criteria and be completely defensible whereas you know you start down the path of affordable housing it could you know mean a lot of things to a lot of people now let me and i'm not my comments was not directed no as uh, was not related to support virginia supportive housing and, program uh, right when i appreciate you i didn't think they were but i'm glad that you said that relative to the question however about the adu 
you're eligible for an ADU even if you're a for-profit developer, are you not? Yes. So, right, if, you're, if your properties are income restricted, then you, uh, in theory, uh, would be unable to command the market rents that other uh, units would, uh, would bear in the, in the open market. Plus, everything has to be verified that, that the individuals that are benefiting from this are whatever percentage of area median income. So that ADU is eligible for anyone doing affordable housing or income restricted, let me put it that way, uh, housing. But like I said, I, I think this one, uh, you know, I did want to throw that out that it was a differentiation. And I appreciate Ms. Uh, Robertson's uh, support on that. Would, would hope this might be our last meeting where we've got 26 of these mm -hmm. to consider. Uh, hopefully that will be the case looking for and welcoming any co-patrons to that. Cynthia? Um, I think earlier, I think Mrs. Samuels wanted to send us back for review on possible eligibility for ADU, but I'd like to suggest that any entity that might be eligible for ADU and or anything else that would reduce the amount of the uh, tax debt would be sent back to have that reviewed to see if that could be reduced and then not denied but simply sent back to have it reviewed and to see if we can get further reduction before we do a final decision. Even if they haven't asked for it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's well, I asked him to apply. It's right. Good. We're not saying that we're not, you know, because we, we're yes. not saying we're not going to give it to you. Right. We're and we're not denying steps. them. We're just saying there's making sure that we, and this is Tyler, uh, being good stewards of the dollars that we have available, um, and that, you know, because they have access available resources. Yeah. So was that a request from Councillor Gilbert and Vice President for a card request for the moratorium request for this mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Okay. Do I need to fill out some paperwork? No, okay, haven't. great. I'll start bringing those up more but, in meetings. But what we're asking is, <laughs> no, that's, that's not what that was for. But in terms, oh, okay. No, I'm sorry. In terms of... I get the look from the Chief of Staff. No, I appreciate that. Okay. And I'll be happy to fill out any paperwork okay. that could be required. In terms of these facilities, we are requesting the applicants go, to go back and um, apply for the ADU, correct? Well, I'm asking that at the point yeah. that even before, really ideally, that we would ascertain a discussion at the, the subcommittee or with Mr. Hester whether or not folks are A, eligible, B, if they're eligible, if they've applied, that before it even comes to us. But in this instance, it has come. I'm suggesting we would not deny them. We would simply ask them to see again we did, would not deny that we one. would not deny Virginia supportive housing. That we would de delay in a decision until there could be some determination of whether they're ADU. You, you, be, you be, <laughs> my understanding, and maybe I'm incorrect. If they go for the ADU application, they get a reduced assessment, which they pay tax on. Right. What well, they're re what they are requesting from us is a full tax exemption, which we, if we ask them to go for the ADU, what we're saying is, at this point, we we don't have the, um, we're not of the mind to give you the full tax that's exemption. That's not what I'm saying. But that's, if we're asking them to go through the ADU process, there's no point in going them, them going saying, through that process if they're going to get the full tax exam. I'm saying, help us help you by getting as much reduced as possible. That, so it, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, it, well, it doesn't I'm missing matter. a part of ADU. So they, if they go, okay, so my property is assessed at 322000 I go to ADU, I, I fill out my application, it is approved, and so now my assessment is $200,000. But well, and so then... And so the tax debt is thereby reduced. But they don't want to pay any. They want to be I tax exempt. I, I so if you that. want them to pay on the two hundred thousand, that's we're, correct. We're saying to them, then go back to ADU. That's correct. And get a lower assessment, but you're going to pay your taxes. No, I'm saying come back to us. 
We are not denying them. I'm not saying deny them. I'm saying go see what see if, if through ADU you get two hundred thousand dollar assessment, which would mean that there's a low, lower annual tax debt. Then you then ask us to cover. But and so that's less out of the pot for us. But and we might be able to do more organizations or have fun, any number of things. Huh? Oh. That's true, but I think that the point that uh, Ms. Brown is making is that we need to deny them and give them this other option. Yeah. Because, I mean, if I got the opportunity right now to be completely exempt from any payment. I'm gonna go for it. I want to go and I'm gonna ride that wagon until it says no way, you're not gonna get it. Then there's another option for me to consider. But I'm saying why would I don't get why if they have ability, if they're eligible to get from four thousand to two thousand, number one, and they come to us to ask for the two thousand. But we're giving it what I mean pay me now, pay me later. What's the difference? If we think they're tax exempt then we give them the tax exempt. If we don't think they're tax exempt, then we say to them, we don't think you should be tax exempt. But, but here's a way well. to, to, to um, get, down, get your, your assessment down so you pay less of taxes. All I'm saying is to them, help us, help you, help, you know, so that others can also. That could be $2,000 reduction for another entity because we didn't have to put four in here. Well. I hear what I, I guess I'm just missing, maybe I'm missing this well I think what Miss Robertson said was if you've got option A until you're denied option A you're not going to settle for plan B or if you settle for plan B then the then the question is answered uh, I mean you wouldn't go back to well now that I've got this let me keep pushing for and this is not without cost of of going through all of these uh, processes uh, to the organizations. I mean, it seemed like to me, and I'm willing to, to vote up or down on all these that are here. I don't want to close the door before these go through the process. But after that, I want to I want to seal it, nail it shut, super glue it, and you know, put some tape around. It. But I'm, I'm willing to look at these that have been through the committee. Because they have gone through the expense and the moratorium was lifted and I think it would be bad faith for us to withdraw the process on those that are in the, have, have gone through the committee process. So I'm saying that, right, I think you, we need to either say yes or no. They can always go back to plan B. But I just, I, I well, you said we have to say yes or no. I, I can go. Yeah, about, about okay. it, about Before everybody jumped in, you know, I was trying to say to this new bill that if you have an organization that has a piece of property that has a four thousand dollar tax on it, and we are, we, we, either way, whether we ask them to do ADU or we go this route, ultimately we're going to have less funds coming in, $4,000. The only difference is, is that it's one pot's going to show it on the ADU will have a certain amount in it, and then the tax relief will have a certain amount in it. So, we're, But at the end of the day, it's the same amount of dollars. And so I think we have to realize one way or another, it's it's ultimately coming out of the same pot. Well, if it's coming out of the same pot, then it doesn't make it the same right. no, it doesn't, that, And that's the point. It's absolutely. coming out of the same that's pot. That's why I was trying to get to that. Yeah, I know. And, okay. and, but anyway, Ms. Robertson, okay. Mr. Hilbert, and, and yeah. everyone jumped in. <laughs> Well, we appreciate the clarification, Mr. Tyler. I raised my hand. I swear to God, I raised my hand. I raised my hand. I swear. I didn't realize. If only we had known those pearls of wisdom were coming out. You know I'm going to always get the pearls of wisdom. Where we are now is... Can I just ask? It is coming out of the two hundred. Fifty thousand dollars set aside the eight. No, my point. My point is, is coming out of all the big pot of all the monies we exempt from the from 
Okay. So my question is, so my question is, do we want to move this forward with yes. these properties with tax exempt um, status? And these properties all deal with homeless. They all deal with homeless. We're all positive that. that. Yes. I, I think, but for this housing. People would be, they're not homeless because they've got a house. So I'm saying that, they, uh, right, but I, well, my this. question is do you have to be homeless to get into one of these? Or if you don't get in, you will be homeless. Yeah, and the only reason I'm asking that is because I don't want to set a precedent. I'm all for it, but I don't want to set a precedent that we get 10 more group homes. I happen to know that Mr. Hester has a stack like this on his desk for next year. Okay? So I, there are people here. From representing these homes, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, so my question to you is, are, is everyone in one of these places, would they be homeless if they were not in your place? The only, uh, only property that has any questionable status at all is James River Apartments. The majority of the residents there would be homeless if they were not living there, but <laughs> Sometimes one of our residents from a different property, so they were homeless when all of this started, but they might move to James River. Um, when they were housed. Yes, when they were housed, it was in one of the um, other properties, and so they sometimes moved to James River. That's the only one where that happens. All of the rest were, they would be homeless, was it not? Um, for this property. They were all so, homeless when they moved in. Except for the James River apartment. Is that a place you move up to? Transitional or transition? Uh, it's not, it's all permanent supportive housing. In the case of James River, it's for people with disabilities as well as people who are homeless. So okay. if you go in on the disability side, it's a different. Okay, I just don't want to get caught up on the next round of group homes. Right. So I'm trying to be Okay, I, that's what I'm asking you. We need the straight answer. Okay, so everyone feels that this tax exempt for these guys? Okay. Okay, the next one, thank new, you. thank you. Thanks for what you do. The next one is new life for you. And if you look down at all of the votes, all of the votes are one to five. One being in favor, five being um, in opposition. You want to give us all back on that, Jim? Uh, the New Youth for Life is uh, a religious organization. It's not church affiliated. That was asked specifically of it. Although there are the, the church that this group came out of is in Chesterfield County off Turner Road, I believe. Um, <clears throat> two of the buildings are definitely group home facilities. One is for females, one is for males. Uh, most of the clients are reformed drug addicts uh, and they've placed them in this environment uh, using private funds. Uh, they, they put them to work, they give them counseling and a lot of supervision. Uh, two of the homes are occupied uh, by the leaders of each of these uh, husband-wife team who are the leaders of one of these groups. Um, they're employed, they do, they do pay on a, some basis, uh, weekly rent. Uh, I think one of the issues, uh, probably the primary issue that the committee had was that it did, didn't seem to be a program that people came in and went through a process and came out. A number of them got into the home and been there for years. questioning, I guess, the structure of that, of that program. Uh, that's about all I can do. Who's the, oh, is the owner um, of, of the homes, um, the church that is located in Chesterfield County? No, we asked that specifically and they said no, it's a separate, separate organization. All of my contact, and I had a number of contacts with, with the, a person in charge of this there in, 
they're in uh, Deland, Florida. I don't understand that. Um, <laughs> Deland, Florida was where I, the person I contacted. So, uh, and, and I can't re I can't remember the name of the pastor and his wife who started this. Very my district. Yeah. Doug, you know, the, you know, <clears throat> well, these folks here have been working with people. Now, you said that these people are staying in these homes on a long basis. Is that what Some are. Some are. Yeah, they, they have no system to move them out if they don't want to leave. Them. For background information, they're also, they purchased a Masonic, old Masonic Lodge on Longford Boulevard, right? Back of Branch's Church. And they want to convert that into one of these homes as well. Um, Forty beds or so. Yeah. What church is that? This is Branch's church. Well, Branch's has nothing to do with it. It's just the next property now right. is this Masonic right. Lodge, which they're buying to convert into one of these homes. Um, they do, um, you know, they're buying. I see they've got several different. They got four different locations in my district. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I really don't. I guess the first thing I would ask is that on property number 20 and, thir and 21, that they would want to be yeah. exempt from where they live? I don't think that would be appropriate either. No, I don't either. No, I don't either. Mm -hmm. Well, they won't. Yeah, I, I just think that's. Yeah. Plus, I mean, these are group homes. Is not we going to defer the decision on those until we get a no, we definition on those? We've gone forward on we went forward on Boaz and Ruth. Uh, we we did. Well, we're waiting to see if other right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. So, do we want to wait on those group homes to see if we've given um, it to similar situations? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Keep it to be consistent. So if we could just say, yeah. right. Right, I thought that's what I heard earlier. You did, yes. you did. Okay, sorry. Okay, so we're going to hold, <laughs> we're going to say no on the uh, single family homes used by the group leader. Seems like someone's already done are we going to support the others? No, we're going to wait no. and say, okay. you know, I, as we go down, we're going to have to define these group homes. But there are so many different group homes. And I'm just fearful that if we start giving tax exemption to any group home that walks through the doors, we are, I, I mean, we are just setting ourselves up for a disaster. Not only for the ones that exist, but for the ones that will start. Will start, exactly. And we have very little exactly. zoning or use as it relates to these houses that has to be come through the city. I, in my we do have that. That's a huge complaint of constituents yeah, from right. my district. Yeah, mine too. The lore is that the greatest concentration of group homes in the state is, is along Changlin Avenue. Avenue. So, for well, whatever I, that's worth. You know, I would just and we say, don't have any control. I mean, the state, yeah, no the state has to shut these places down. That's right. And they have under just deplorable conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I don't think we want to perpetuate and they, that they kind of. have to come get a special use permit to set up a group. Home. No, they don't. I have them in. No, they don't. Not at all. You've got them. I'm sure you haven't done. I have them mm -hmm. all sure, over in every neighborhood. And their complaints. In every we neighborhood, have, I have their group homes. There are plenty of good people out there doing a lot of good work. Right. Unfortunately, we There's don't no have control. the we don't have the policing power that this the Virginia Department of Social Services that can decertify these places, and that doesn't happen that often. Yes, Bruce. Thank you, Ms. Graziano. I appreciate you <laughs> recognizing me. You know, this is uh, this. I think this is a very interesting conversation, and perhaps this is a conversation we should move to the government agenda with the General Assembly dealing with this because what I'm hearing you say, and I, I mean, if there's something we should be lobbying for because it's, it sounds like we're kind of like this, and let's 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 have a come let's get that's, it on the agenda. And that's, I would say I agree with you 100%. That's where it comes from. Yeah. That's, that's who sent it to us. All right, second good idea for the dog. Okay. <laughs>
All right, Good Samaritan, that's next. And does anybody have any problem? The committee recommended both of these five to zero. For approval? For approval. Yeah, for approval. So this first I see five zero. So now we can Okay. And they are truly operating by their mission and they do exactly. Okay. And I think the, this committee did a pretty good job trying to, to weigh yeah. this stuff. I really did. All right, now we have Bruce. Are you ready to? Uh, I can't uh, speak on this matter. <laughs> you I'm can't. I actually let you all leave. I, I, they're a client of mine, so I. Oh, okay. I cannot. I'm gonna leave. But can I ask you one question before you leave? Or I guess I'm gonna ask. Uh, you need to ask the city attorney. The city attorney or Hester. One more before. Please. I'm coming back. Oh. Well, do you, want me, Mark, do you want me to just do friends east and daycare and then you can leave? No, because all we have appointments and other things to do. Yeah. We may or may not get to all that. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm willing to okay. come back. All right, you're a great okay. guy. All right, and do you have a question for him? I do have a question, and my question is for this one, before we start discussing it, they have asked not only for uh, personal, for, not only for real estate, but for personal property. So I'd like to deal with the personal property first. You know, I would just like to say that, except with the exception of the transplant people, who we gave an exception for personal property to, I can't think of a nonprofit. I can't think of a nonprofit we have ever given personal property relief to. So let's put that on the table first. <coughs> No. 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 Okay. This is this on the personal property. This on the real estate. Okay. This is a personal property. I just think that's a stretch. Okay. Okay. All right. Now let's go back to. Um, and you want to tell us about that? No, Get no, Al? Uh, to brief us, we have one other side to match. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it was back in. Right before the, the moratorium was implemented, the name of the organization was Metropolitan Junior Baseball League or something to that effect. They did have two vehicles that they wanted. Oh, I remember that, and yeah. I think the okay. committee did vote in favor of that exemption. Those are the only, that's the only organization that I'm aware of that even okay. asked for and got and okay. received an exemption. Thanks. Okay, thank you to break a good memory. I do remember that now that you say it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's go. Jim, you want to tell us about Virginia League for Planned Parenthood, Inc.? Uh, the Virginia League for Planned Parenthood has an office building at 201 North Hamilton Street. It's their Central Virginia uh, location. I believe the building burned uh, in the mid 2000s, and uh, I think maybe Mr. Tyler's firm was involved in the Reconstruction. Uh, they've applied for an exemption on the on the building and the com and the com and property and the committee had uh, raised uh, several issues. They questioned the compensation package paid to the CEO. Uh, which are we open to discuss that or not for numbers? Well, I think it's probably. They felt like the compensation package exceeded what it needed to be. Uh, they spend a, a, an annual amount of money uh, before the General Assembly on a regular basis uh, for lobbying purposes. Uh, and it's actually far above the annual tax debt that they pay to the city. Uh, I mentioned here they have contracts with the city, but I think they often partnership with the city on uh, women's health issues, and uh, they describe a, a new uh, program that was just starting up, in fact. Uh, that the Is that the city, breast cancer program? Where they actually take over the, the acute care of these mm -hmm. stage three situations because there doesn't seem to be a facility that can do it, and they volunteer to do it. So there's a constant exchange of uh, monies uh, between, uh, you know, they pay us taxes, and we pay them a lot of money for services that uh, they perform. And that's pretty much it. 
Okay, and this is the Virginia League for Planned Parenthood, so this is a state league. Yes. Which is also supported by funding around the state, I would guess. That's how they get their money. Okay. All right. Cynthia? Did we look at CEO compensation packages for all of these Yes. Mm -hmm. It's one of the mandates. It's, it's one of them. One. Just want to make sure. And um, it's mentioned here that they have contracts with the city, but there's at least another entity that has to receive city funding, but we didn't mention that or didn't come up with it. For example, who has to receive city funding, but that was not. Um, yeah, they receive compensation for services. But does Boas and Ruth receive compensation or a grant? Yeah, they actually have grants. They're, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, and I believe it's at least seven thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like saying that. it wasn't mentioned. So I'm just making sure we were consistent. They do the work. We pay them for it. They do the work. They have a contract with us. They have a contract grant. Yes. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the committee considered was number six under the state headed, whether a substantial part of the activities involves carrying on propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation, uh, participates or intervenes in political campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the concern with the lobbyist expenditure. On the director compensation, was it considered in excess of a reasonable allowance uh, based yeah. on the work that it's... <coughs> I mean, is it just a big number? I mean, that's, it's hard without the numbers to be able to say whether or not that was a reasonable concern or not. Uh, I believe you can go online and check their 990 and they yeah. have that information. I think both that and the lobbyists, but I guess my question on this would be, since it's the Virginia League for Planned Parenthood, even, and so their director, that's a state director in the state lobbyist, but are, should we be giving tax exempt uh, status to a state organization that is headquartered here? For example, and I don't know if we do or not, but I know that, I believe that uh, the Virginia Lung Association was in Richmond for a while. I know Virginia Heart Association was in Richmond for a while. Did we give tax exempt status to those? Because those are state groups who just happen to be located here. And so, have we in the past given those state groups tax exemption? Because if we have, then fine. But if we haven't, once again, we're opening the door for every state group who's here for a nonprofit. And we have a lot of them because the General Assembly. So, that's a question we need to have, in my mind, we they need did to have. have they did not. I don't know if the Lung Association owned their building. That would be a criteria. They did. They actually, they did own a building right, sort of right near where I live. They moved out, out of wherever they were and they bought a building. So I know at least they did. In right, um, the Heart Association was in Enrico. So that would not apply. But we have a lot of nonprofits who have their headquarters in the city of Richmond. And I think Where's we... Else? Right, is the red well the red cross is probably exempt by state. But it's an example of that. Good example. I'm not and I think we need it. to look. I don't. Not one way or the other on this. I just don't want to set the precedent on this if we haven't done it in the past. No. Okay. If we haven't done it in the past, then I don't think. We're in a position to to um, put that in motion. So, if you find something to the contrary, then let us know Monday. But otherwise, we're not in favor of that. Okay. Don't let you talk. Oh, you're a nice guy. All right, friends. East End Daycare. Support. Yes, sir. I was going to let Jim talk about it for a minute because oh, okay. that went zero five against it. <clears throat> this is. Uh, I'm trying to steer away from number one here. Uh, number three 
Do we know the percentage of, of folks that are served in front of the third? third. Okay. Third. Third. okay. You know, I I appreciate that there are poor people uh, that live in the county. Uh, and we're starting to keep records on that with respect to our parks and rec program. Uh, you know, I really, uh, I don't see the reverse happening myself here. I don't see Henrico County assisting organizations that serve children in the city of Richmond. I'd love to hear about some, uh, but I don't think that happens. Uh, could be. Um, you don't have a membership card, you can't come in. With, with respect to this facility? With, counties, with respect to counties. Oh, okay. <laughs> I would like to know I, what it is we give them in grants also. Well, we're now applying a grant. We didn't ask that for some of the others that we give grants. Right, right. But I would we just... We did give them to give us grants. We did, that mm -hmm. are in this pile here. And I'm saying I'm okay with applying right, that I, as long as we apply. Yeah, I would like to know that. I guess I've been... We've got Boaz and Ruth and Holt, so I'd like to see what we give them also. Virginia Supportive Housing. We, yeah. Do we, we get them grants? We do. Yeah. CDBG money. We do, yeah. Okay. Now these are for... And we augment their operational costs mm -hmm. for right. Virginia Supportive Housing. Mm -hmm. So, but, and, and what about and we daycares? We got, do we also Boaz exempt other daycares? For, Housing. I, I don't know the answer. I'd like to know. So the housing that they were available with that money. This becomes a critical <laughs> asset well, when you're trying to deal with, even though I hear your statement about the counties, two-thirds of the folks still are from the city. Absolutely. And I don't have this capacity. Do we know that, that do, but the organization, I'm assuming, would receive payments from Henrico DSS for the services that they provide? What? I'm not sure. It could be a family that's just paying for their time. Oh, okay. I mean, you can stand in the East End and the County at the same time. Oh. Well, the places. Right. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I'm, what I'm saying is that the organization is receiving the benefit because you, if you reside in the county, do you have to be a self pay person versus. I don't have any. I mean, but the question, I guess the but vast the majority would be would be supplemented by DSS, the payments to this organization. Some number, sorry. Okay, Some but number, not necessarily. But there are, there are okay, that also pay. okay. Okay. But the question, uh, and that payment system now that I'm sitting here thinking about it all went to the state uh, very recently. The city of Richmond doesn't pay that stuff out anymore for daycares, which I did in this. Committee. But all of these service for all of these clientele that we've talked about, some of them are free. We don't know whether any of some where these people the come from. These people clients. come from different states. They don't even no, relate. Okay. Some of them. You, but, hey, you know, you know, the I, mean, are you know. well, I don't think people that are homeless are homeless in the metro area. I suppose. I mean, you don't know, but but, but you don't the know county. whether or not. I mean, people say. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. People are bust in to Richmond for homelessness because they provide services for us. Okay, I've heard they're that. not just the okay. county. Okay, and Mr. Connor has been yeah. very patiently waving his hand. Yeah, and since I was accused of not calling on somebody before, I think you know I don't these, that again. these are political decisions. I've got a couple of folks here that really feel this is a good thing. I don't know if implies to agree and say yes on this. You're always better off at the end of them. All right, so is it feeling that friends, East End Daycare, is, is, will get a tax exam? Only at the start of my property. Okay. In the 6th district? Not bad. Okay. All right, now we have to do a couple of things here. Housekeeping. We are going to have a. We have down here a budget retreat. Lou and I have talked. We're going to we would like to be able to have a retreat in November and then a little bit pass it to you. Thank you, Jabrika. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, Lower yourself. <laughs>
we have done it in the past where we've had a whole morning retreat or a whole afternoon retreat. Um, we would, Lou and I have been talking. We think it would be a good idea to do a council retreat that had budget in it along with some housekeeping things that we need to do. So um, anyway, then I'm going to pass it to you. And okay, we talked about um, most of you, well, some of you did not. The October date would not work. I tried to come up with a date where I knew most folks would be available, but I understand that. So we're going to look to after November 6th. So I wanted to try and see when we might be able to come up with a date, maybe just for about four hours for that retreat. Um, and when I get a date from you, I can work with schools that express they'd like to be in on the planning, in addition, of course, with the administration. But for now, we just need a date for about four hours from members of council. Um, what about, what about, I'm sorry, go ahead. Madam President, before we uh, proceed with that, I, you know, I think the Finance Committee, um, you know, I think when we put together these retreats and so we deal with issues of finance, you know, uh, the Finance Committee spent an enormous amount of time looking at budgets, looking at budget cycles, working with the administration as it relates to budget cycles and so forth and so on. Um, you know, the objective of the council uh, is a lot, I know that the budget is the largest policy that we make during the course of our tenure here, but, um, you know, we've got lots of legislative uh, issues that are going to have a tremendous impact as it relates to um, budgetary decisions, but other decisions as well. I agree with Mr. Tyler that you know we, we really need to deal with the legislation as it relates to these group homes and the lack of local local government's involvement in the process. Um, so I, I I think we can pick a date, but I, I am a little concerned as to how we go about setting the agenda for our retreats and what is really going to be discussed. Okay. Yeah, Just a couple things. I agree with Vice President Adelaide. And I would like to think that we would have, I don't want to preempt any committees who have been established to address schools specifically, but I don't wish to revisit the, the process that we had for schools and school budgeting um, that we had this past year. Um, I think we have some real decisioning relative to level of funding, notwithstanding any of the recommendations that will come out, it's not going to be, probably if we pull them all, we're not going to get to them. And so the sooner we can start with all the partners, I'm not mm -hmm. uh, at the table, the better from my perspective. I, uh, yeah, I don't want to wax. I I, then, uh, the last thing with proliferation of things when we're talking about them, um, um, I'd really like to look at corner stores. Uh, and some other kinds of things that we don't have regular that are proliferating and yes, corner stores, corner stores, corner stores. And while yeah, while they are certainly if you want to call it for economic <laughs> development, uh, <laughs> to have them in such C close proximity to each other that you could throw a stone from one to the next does not bespeak what we're trying to. So proliferate, there are several things that are proliferating. Um, so it, it, That's it, an it, issue, that issue right there that you just brought up, I'm sorry, no, but mm -hmm. that issue that you just brought up is an issue that land use can bring up and work with zoning on that. Because I hear what you're saying 100%. Zoning and, and the planning are the people who can help us figure out how you prevent that from happening. Maybe there need to be some zoning changes, but and that that is a way to, to get it back. Prevent the establishment I of these you. entities, but I literally have one that just opened. You could literally throw a stone to the one across the street. You know, and which is which is the same 
for the homes that you have exactly. all the way down exactly. There's an no avenue where you have so, I'm sorry. good service providers that decide to cluster your entire this was supposed to be your business district right. into a social service district, which means you will never exactly. add anything else into the. So those are land use issues, issues that we have. And I guess my my thing is not so much. I think it's important that the council have a retreat, but I think it's also important that council talks about what are all our priorities and what is going to be the agenda for the retreat. Um, we we can have several retreats. We can have a retreat just on budget, and I understand that's a that's a four hour plus more retreat all by itself, and that's fine. But but that. I think it's only one of the concerns that we have as it relates to a council. And I think that is part of the reason why we had, and as uh, I had a discussion with Mr. Hilbert earlier, is that when we have, when the council's priorities are not incorporated into our, discuss, our total discussion and set priorities that drive what we want to see as priorities for for budget cycles and so forth. Uh, the city just recently did the citizen survey thing. Uh, and, and so the survey could be a driving factor by the administration as to where we put our money. And I think we all need to be responsive to that because we're servicing the same citizens that were surveyed. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not objecting to a retreat just for budget. What I am asking is that the council needs to have a retreat. It's difficult to have a retreat just for budget if we haven't agreed on what are our priorities and where we want to see money go. And that's the problem that I think that I, I'm raising as it relates to how we set our agenda for a retreat and how we drive ourselves. Go ahead, Mr. I think we're talking about having something after the election, and uh, none of us are guaranteed to be here in January. Uh, no, that's not true. Or tomorrow. <laughs> right, or tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, I guess there's an argument to be made that you're in your seat until December 31 and working to, for the citizens, but if, if uh, you know, something happens, what are the, I mean, there's no input from these new people not I mean they're but they don't take office till January just a consideration I don't want to postpone this forever but uh, is that a, an issue for anyone that what, what, what do you, you think of what, that? what you're saying I want to make sure I didn't hear the beginning of the conversation you're thinking after the election we hold the retreats no I'm just saying that after the retreats some of us may not be in office well, my much longer, and new people coming in, and they may not, and they wouldn't be a part of this. So, do we want to delay this until everybody's in office? In January? Bruce, go ahead, and then Lou and I have something. I, I, so, I, new I, people will be able to come if we invite them. Right. They could come. Go ahead. Say it. Well, you know, I guess it is a public meeting. Okay. I, I mean, my 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 point is. If we have an election and <laughs> folks change, I think if it would be our duty to say we're going to be holding these public meetings, dealing with the future of the city, dealing with the issues that we're facing, we would we would make a special invitation to those individuals. Uh, and allow them to come and participate. It's, I think it's a very simple thing to do. I would also like to go on record saying I would love for the administration to participate. This is part of this, and maybe we yeah. need to make ourselves clear. Yeah. One of the things that we would hope to accomplish at this retreat is that we would have schools there, we would have administration there. I may there. have missed it because I was out of the room. We would have, I might not have said it, we would have administration there, and we would be there so that we could work together, A, identifying priorities, right. and B, working on a process that um, the finance department, the finance committee has worked very, very hard with the budget. Mm -hmm. 
But most of our presentations have been somebody with one of those laser beams, or whatever you call them, red dotting around on the screen behind us. And I think that that has not, I think that that has not been productive for us, and has not been productive for administration. And hopefully, if we can sit down and have this one retreat, and maybe we have to have another one six weeks after that, that we can work out, hey, where, what our priorities are, where we're going with it, what kind of information we want, and how we're going to get it, so that when we come to the budget um, process, that we, it is indeed a meaningful process um, and productive process for both council, administration, and schools. So I think that's where we all want to get to. And, yes, yeah, sure. and the only thing that I'd like to say in regard uh, considering the fact that Mr. Tyler probably have a better approach to how to say what I'm going to say, he will edify it. He will edify it and make it say what it needs to say. Uh, but if you would uh, just allow me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. Um, we are working with the administration right now. We have put together a very extensive review budget planning process that includes when they need certain, they have certain benchmarks that have to be met in order for us to put together a budget and accomplish many of the concerns that we've experienced one year after the next, after the next, after the next. And I think that we are making pro continual process, progress as it relates to this. By November, before Turkey, and at the election, this process is very far, far down the road. And we've received some preliminary information as the committee, and I think, and, and, and will the entire council. Um, so I, I think that council setting prior, having a budget committee, a budget retreat, a retreat on the purpose of dealing with budget for priorities needs to be taken into consideration as to the timeline that we need to be responsive to if we don't want red dots and you know those kinds of things because there are some critical thresholds that are going to come up before that that have, that have got to be dealt with and require some real input from council before that process. And this is the council right now that is going to influence the budget for next year. It's not going to be the elected. They will get to vote on it. Um, but this is the council that has got to work through that process to get to that. And so I, 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 I raise concern about the timeliness and, and, and how we would want for the budget process to be contingent upon our, you know, post-election before Turkey retreat. Hmm. I, I, I'm going to be free. It's okay. I can I'm not If you're working with you, I can go. Vice <laughs> President, I think we need to go forward immediately. We needed to have gone forward as soon as we could the last budget that based on the major issues that came out of it, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and the clear on the priorities and then we had to make drive. I mean, I, I, we can't afford to wait. I got to go. This thing is ditto. <clears throat> Not change subject, but I was wondering if the clerk would mind putting this paper in the family chamber at our desks. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Connor. Right, let me, let me, throw, let me throw one thing out on the budget. The administration. <laughs> We and Lou had sent out an email that said we wanted to do the budget October 4th. It was our understanding that there were council people who were opposed to that. But more importantly today was the fact that administration said that they needed to do it later. I concur with what's been said. And if we can do it October 4th, and you can do it October 4th, I'm go. We, we got a request 
Which, which pushes us, then we can't do it at the end of October. We can do it at the beginning of October. The end of October is bad. So why don't you go back to the drawing board and see if we, if we can do it. The, was it the 4th that it we had? It was October 4th because that was the day we had the organization the bell. Um, oh, okay. And we said we meet at 4 o'clock instead of 5. Right. Which That's makes sense, request. which works. Right, that works Excuse for me. Excuse me, October 1st. Mr. Tyler. Uh, why, why don't, if we're, if we're pushing for this, and we know we're going to be spending four hours, I, I think it would be nice to start at three. Well, I put the four because of Councilor Hilbert. I mean, and that Some was people work. I am, uh, and I appreciate <laughs> the defense of, of that here, Ms. Graziano. However, every Monday afternoon is my uh, time off. Oh, okay. So, so we could do it at three. That's perfect. Uh, Okay. Is it? If you could find out if that works with you, okay. you talk to your people and then talk to our people. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Well, and, and just speaking on behalf of Councilor Trammell, she too was the one that said that date was not. Okay. Well, I I concur that we need to. If we can't have it on October fourth, we have to wait until after the election. October. Some people, some people who want to have it. October first. Before election are not opposed. And I'm not suggesting well, that we have it before any time. What I'm suggesting is well, we that we be sensitive to the total process of what is involved with the budget and also that we put okay. out a detailed agenda so that council members can weigh in on making sure that we have on the agenda what we need to have. Okay. On the budget. And we are working on a preliminary draft of the agenda. Going back to the um, Vice President's earlier point, we are, the process has started, and that's the reason why I was trying to push for an earlier date, because mm -hmm. while we have had meetings, and we've been involved in doing the planning, but all of the other yeah, members have been critical to those discussions, and I think the that's part of um, the challenge we face before. is trying to bring everybody in after the so decisions have been made. So I'm hoping that if we get this October 1st date, we can bring everybody to yeah, the table in reference to our priority and how we want to the process work going forward. It's very good. So yeah. we're set for October the 1st at 3. I'll um, set that on. Yeah. I'm closer because I'm here at 1st and 4th. I gave the wrong date. It's oh. October 1st. Is that first? Oh, it's the 1st? Okay. It's the 1st. So this was in lieu of or in addition to an organizational in, development? In lieu of. Yes, in lieu of the organizational development. Actually, you can open up with that, but it's a retreat. Did we have uh, the tentative location? No, I haven't set any of that because i got to know on the date. Well, I've got it in the calendar now. And I will so. talk with Ms. Jefferson to make sure. And it was good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam but President. But if you could think about your priorities, and I will sit down. Um, the staff is already working on the preliminary track, so you will be getting that soon. Now that I meet with the President. Madam President. Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion that we defer the rest of the agenda to <laughs> Monday's meeting. The, the informal Does that mess meeting. anything up on the appointment? Oh, yes, it does. PRTC. Oh. Because we're trying to oh, get ahead of their um, October okay. meeting, so you do need to review that um, those applications. The president all right, it's the same three that are on now. Is there anybody that uh, they are all eligible name? to serve? They're all eligible to serve. I recommend we go with them. Second. Okay. <laughs> The rest of the committee appointments. Now, I'd like to give out the mail that there. came to my office. Reva Trammell, she's not here. Cynthia Newbell, I don't get your mail at 1648 Farm Still Avenue. Wow. <laughs> don't ask me. I don't know. I just got it. Don't ask me. Go ask me. Well, okay, is there anything else? They probably think that all of the council members are at your office. That's right. They're all hanging out. Madam President, I'll make a motion.